to talk to you about I'm going to talk to you about uh, the risks of pesticide exposure and their effects on non-apis bees. And that's obviously quite a grand title. Um, we're mostly going to focus in today's talk on bumblebees and some more recent work we've been doing on ground nesting squash bees, which are solitary bees, which tend to get underrepresented in much of the literature and the bee literature in general, but certainly uh, when we're talking about pesticide exposure. And as Christoph mentioned, this work was conducted primarily at Royal Holloway University of London and more recently at the University of Guelph, and it represents some of the work we've been doing over the last 10 or 12 years. So before I get into the presentation, I just wanted to, uh, to acknowledge uh, that the University of Guelph resides on the ancestral lands of the Atawandaran people and the treaty lands and territories of the Mississaugas of the Credit that we recognize the significance of the dish with one spoon covenant to this land and offer our respect to our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee and Métis neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. Acknowledge, uh, acknowledging that them reminds us of our important connection with this land where we live, learn and work. So uh, obviously that's true of, of many places around the world, but we just wanted to, to, to make that land acknowledgement. I think it's rather an important thing to do. So, so we're all very familiar with bees. This is a, a bee ecology uh, and evolution seminar series. So uh, I, I don't need to, to explain to you why bees are important and why they're charismatic and why we should all care about them in terms of the, the pollination services they provide to crops and wild plants. And we also know that bees are in, in, in quite a degree of uh, bother in terms of the, the different stress factors that are affecting them. We know habitat loss and degradation is a big problem uh, without the resources for nesting and, and foraging that bees need. Um, that's, that's a major problem for them at whether they can survive in different environments. We know pathogens are an issue, uh, both existing and emergent pathogens, invasive species, which can also overlap with pathogens. If, for, um, and climate change is a factor that is affecting lots and lots of different things, uh, including, of course, pollinators. And I'm going to talk mostly about agrochemicals today, uh, pesticides, different types of pesticides, including insecticides, fungicides uh, uh, and other types of pesticides. And clearly where um, bees are foraging, particularly in agricultural landscapes, their potential for exposure to these pesticides may be quite significant. And we'll also touch a little bit on some of the interactions between different types of pesticides. And clearly we also need to think when we're thinking about bee health, about the interactions between all these different environmental stress factors. But obviously at this point, that's beyond the scope of this presentation. Um, so we'll be focusing mostly on, on pesticides themselves. So how might pesticides affect bees? Well, we've got this nice cartoon here of these bumblebees foraging in an agricultural landscape. Uh, this is probably imagined to be uh, to Northern Europe somewhere, perhaps the United Kingdom, where the bumblebees are going out and foraging on a range of different uh, crop systems, including something like oilseed rape or canola, sunflowers, and also foraging on non-crop plants. And typically those different uh, cropping systems will receive uh, one or more pesticides applied at different times during the cropping season. Uh, and so bees, if they're visiting different types of crops, may be exposed to multiple different types of pesticides, whether they're visiting one crop or multi many, many crops. And they may also be exposed to pesticide residues through things like spray drift or movement of systemic pesticides in groundwater um, taken up by, uh, by non-crop plants as well. So there may be significant exposure in and around agricultural fields. And clearly that sort of combined exposure those sort of cocktail effects may be very important and something uh, that uh, generally speaking is not, not captured in environmental risk assessments for pesticide safety um, at the moment and is actually quite difficult to do. And the modes of applications of these different pesticides are uh, vary substantially and that obviously has an impact on the, the roots and likelihood of exposure for, for bees in terms of the pesticides that they encounter. So sort of traditionally, we might think about a, a tractor or, or, or a, a plane or a helicopter overflying uh, a, a field and spraying um, active ingredients, spraying pesticides or mixtures of pesticides on crops. And clearly, 
we have an example here of a, of a tractor going through a, an oilseed rake field, um, spraying from a boom sprayer. So we can see that there may be a potential for exposure if this is happening at flowering, which it is here. Um, if there are bees actually um, foraging on the crop, they may be directly exposed to droplets or they may come into contact with the active ingredients the, of, the, of the pesticides on the flowers, um, uh, whether that's a dry or wet uh, application uh, or sorry, whether that's dry or wet residues on the flowers, depending on how quickly they get to them after being sprayed. So that's mostly going to be an acute exposure, a relatively short term exposure, and it's mostly going to be a contact exposure. So contact with the exterior cuticle of the bee, which is relatively compared to things like the gut lumen, relatively impermeable to many chemicals. So, uh, so that would be more of an acute uh, exposure scenario. Um, Many pesticides are also applied uh, in addition to being uh, potentially sprayed into crops are applied as different forms of soil treatments. Here we have in the middle uh, a tractor pulling a seed drill and it's planting uh, insecticide treated seeds. So in this case, neonicotinoid treated seeds. Um, so there, is, there are different routes of exposure here. Uh, there's potential for the coating of the seed which contains the active ingredient to become actually damaged or uh, rubbed off as it goes through the machinery. And so some of the, the dust from that can go into the atmosphere and can cause acute exposure to any bees that are flying at the point where planting is happening, which in Ontario is happening right now, uh, the sort of plantings. Um, and then these, these insecticides are used as seed treatments because they're systemic um, and they can be taken up, they're highly water soluble. And when, they, when the, the seeds get into the ground, um, the, the seed germinates and starts to take up the active ingredient from the soil and is there, therefore present in all of the growing tissues of the plant. So it provides the, the strongest protection, the, the highest concentrations uh, in the tissues when the plant is young and so it will help to protect against uh, root, root feeding and uh, initial shoot feeding insects uh, but you see residues of these pesticides in the plants as they grow as, even as they get larger and to the point where they're also expressing those in the floral tissues so they may be also finding residues in the nectar and pollen of these plants on which bees are clearly going to be feeding if they're bee attractive crops. So the roots of exposure um, are, are more likely there to be very low level dosages in those uh, in the nectar and pollen, but they may be chronic exposure over long periods of time where bees may be feeding on a mass firing crop for some days or even weeks in some cases, and they will be taking those resources back and feeding them to their larvae uh, um, or, or, or provisioning the, the cells of their nest with them. Clearly, there are other types of pesticides to which um, uh, bees become exposed, and uh, one specific to honeybees would be miticides that are directly applied in the hive by beekeepers to control varroa mites, uh, and they may interact with the impacts of insecticides and may actually be the same active ingredients at different concentrations. So they may either add to the toxic burden or potentially add in different active ingredients, which may also be, uh, uh, to which the bees may be sensitive. And we know that particularly where GM crops are grown extensively, herbicide use can be quite high. Uh, and there is some evidence uh, in, emerging that those herbicides themselves may actually have a toxic effect on bees, but certainly they have an, an indirect impact on bees if they're removing non-crop plants in, the, in agricultural environments, which might be alternative foraging sources for bees. Um, certainly outside the window where those mass flowering crops are actually flowering, they're going to be very, very important to bees. And we know fungicides uh, are being sprayed extensively and often co-formulated with insecticides where they're applied. So there may be um, uh, synchronous exposure or there may be uh, offset exposures at different times during the, the foraging season. Uh, or the foraging period for those bees and those fungicides may interact with other agrochemicals including insecticides and there's certainly quite a bit of evidence to suggest that those interactions do occur. We've talked a little bit about um, the movement of some of these pesticides and certainly th this is very uh, has been very much a, a source of concern around uh, systemic pesticides like neonicotinoids uh, 
So here's an example from one of Dave Goulson's papers um, looking at the, the environmental fate of the active ingredient neonicotinoids on a, on a treated seed. So um, the estimates here are about 1% of the active ingredient is lost in dust. So during the planting procedure that we saw, so scarification of the seeds as they go through and just mechanical abrasion of seeds as they go through the mechanism, somewhere between two and 20%, uh, put it here as 5% going up into the, the, the crop that's being taken up by the, by the, uh, from, from the seed coating by the, by the growing crop and then somewhere between 80 and 95% of the active ingredient remaining in the soil or moving around in the, in the water uh, found in the soil. So uh, if that's moving towards the field margins, uh, that will be taken up by uh, non-crop plants and may be expressed similarly in the nectar and pollen that they produce. So there may be an extension of the period over which bees are exposed to these pesticides at low level chronic doses. Um, and obviously uh, leaching and movement of water into the waterways, which can have impacts on, uh, on aquatic invertebrates uh, and certainly seems to be, although that's obviously beyond the scope of this talk. So we'll, we'll contain ourselves to bees for the time being. So we've been thinking about um, exposure uh, to, to uh, pesticides for, for some time, um, and we've been working on different model systems. Uh, a lot of the work we've been doing has been on bumblebees, and bumblebees are pretty, uh, are pretty special in a number of reason, for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons they're kind of special is that they kind of bridge um, the solitary to social um, uh, life history gap, if you like. Um, so during their life, life history, the queens spend a, a substantial amount of the time alone, either during hibernation or, or in spring, when they're setting up their colony before the workers emerge. And then they obviously change from that, that situation where they're effectively, the queens are effectively acting like a solitary female bee and doing all the things that solitary female bees do to moving over to being much more like a honeybee queen uh, and bossing a, a colony and, and, and making sure uh, all the workers are doing the right things uh, during the colony development. And clearly they're making reproductive decisions for the colony and when to, to move from production for workers to production of sexual, so males and new queens for the colony. So you can see that in our, uh, a cartoon from a former graduate student, uh, Gemma Barron produced this cartoon. And from a pesticide perspective, um, much of what we know about pesticide exposure and impacts has been derived from studies of honeybees. And honeybees are obviously perennial social uh, colony dwelling organisms, so they're quite unique, they're quite special in terms of bees. Uh, when we know that most bees are actually numerically are solitary bees, uh, focusing our, our efforts solely on colony dwelling individuals is going to give us a slightly biased view of how pesticides might affect, um, uh, might affect bees more generally. And we can see that there's a, there's a, a colony structure uh, and that that colony structure may be affected by insecticides and that's something that, that is obviously important. But we've been focusing uh, substantially on, on bumblebees, the different parts of that life history. And as we say, um, the, the queen is effectively the colony during this period or from the autumn uh, when she leaves the colony, once she mates, um, and then she overwinters on her own, usually underground, emerges in the spring if she's lucky enough to survive hibernation, looks for flowers, uh, looks for nesting sites and starts to set up her colony. So lays down wax, lays eggs and then starts to feed those larvae as they emerge until they emerge uh, until uh, they pupate and become her first series of workers. So we can imagine that those particular individuals are obviously very important. Uh, the queens uh, would be, uh, each queen is potentially a colony later on in the season. So any impacts of environmental stresses, including pesticides on those queens might be very, very significant in terms of the, the, the population persistence of the bumblebees going forward. So we've done a number of experiments where we've been looking at, uh, uh, at bumblebee queens uh, as if they uh, and trying to replicate the sort of exposures that they experience in the spring. So here's a bumblebee queen foraging on oilseed rape or canola. Um, and this is a major flowering crop in the UK and most parts of Europe that bumblebees will use. Uh, 
we know that a number of different bumblebee species use that and, and we could, or we could pick uh, different cropping systems. We, so for example, in Ontario, we know that things like apples and other flowering uh, tree fruits are important for, for bumblebee queens um, there. So this is a nice photo from Emily Bales that kindly provided this for and allowed me to use it for the presentation. So this is some work that uh, uh, a former grad student of mine and Mark Brown's, Gemma Barron did, uh, working on uh, four different species of bumblebee that she found foraging uh, on, or she observed foraging on oilseed rape. Uh, these were collected close to Royal Holloway in Windsor Great Park, and the bumblebees were brought into the lab. They were checked for pathogens, and none of those that had pathogens were included in the experiment. And then they were fed, they were randomly assigned to different uh, treatments, either a control treatment where they were fed sugar water and pollen that was untreated with pesticide, or they were allocated to uh, pesticides of uh, 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 thymothoxam, uh, which is a neonicotinoid insecticide um, in, in, in sugar water at either 1.87 or 5.32 parts per billion, which are levels that uh, are found in the uh, nectar and pollen or can be found in the nectar and pollen of oilseed rape and other crops on which these uh, bees would be foraging. And after four weeks, uh, Gemma did some dissections of the bees and found significant differences uh, across uh, the treatment groups in terms of the, the size of the terminal oocytes. So um, giving an indication of how much investment those queens have made into reproduction. We know that during hibernation, uh, investment in reproductive structures is very low. And so they have to kickstart egg laying and reproduction in the spring and invest substantially in that to help them uh, found colonies. And we can see that the terminal oocytes were about five to almost 15% smaller with the, the highest level of, uh, of thymothoxam exposure. So we can see that although this isn't a, 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 a sort of lethal effect, we can see that sublethal impacts on physiology and behavior are occurring for these queens. Furthermore, some more of Gemma's work uh, showed that there's an interaction between um, the pesticide impact and the stress of um, the, 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 the stress of hibernation. So she artificially hibernated a bunch of queens for different lengths of time, a short hibernation period and a long hibernation period of six and 12 weeks respectively, which uh, compared to what we see in the field is obviously quite a, a short hibernation period for, for somewhere like the UK and certainly very short for some of the North American uh, regions that, that you might be working in like say, say Canada. Um, and we did those as, as a relative short period because we were concerned about high levels of mortality on our experiments. And when bees emerged from, um, from hibernation, they were randomly assigned to either pesticide or, or control treatments. In the pesticide treatment, they were fed 2.4 parts per billion of thiamethoxam in sugar water for two weeks in the lab. And then we monitored, or rather Gemma monitored, the, the likelihood of those bees uh, founding colonies within the next 10 weeks. And we can see here for both the short and the long hibernation period, the proportion of queens that had eggs over that period. And you can see in both cases, those that were exposed to, ne uh, to the neonicotinoid thiamethoxam has substantially reduced uh, likelihood of, of founding colonies. And when we combine the data and do the analysis, we find that uh, overall colony initiation was, was reduced by about a quarter, 26%. Uh, lower likelihood of thymothoxam exposed queens actually founding a colony. And that seems like quite a substantial difference. Um, uh, if a quarter of those queens exposed to low levels of neonicotinoid at the sort of levels that they might encounter in the field, even with a relatively uh, benign hibernation regime, which is much less physiological, physiologically stressful, um, that seems like a, a big impact on population demography. <clears throat> and um, clearly what we can see, the difference between the short and long hibernation shows you how stressful hibernation is. So the, the bees that were less um, able to deal with hibernation will have died before the start of that part of the experiment. So we see that those that went through a long hibernation are the higher quality uh, queens and therefore on average are more likely to, to found colonies. So they are the better queens uh, out of the group that went into the artificial hibernation period. <clears throat> 
So we can see that things like insecticides like neonicotinoids may be having substantial effects on the physiology of the bees in terms of their reproductive system. And that seems to have an impact on their behavior and their likelihood of founding colonies in the lab. So that's obviously something that's concerning. So what happens when, um, when the, the, the colonies develop and the colonies go out and forage and, and the workers are looking for uh, nectar and pollen, particularly pollen, to produce new, uh, new offspring, new, new, new sisters, new workers for the colony? Well, this is some work from a former postdoc, Dara Stanley, that uh, we just done at Royal Holloway as well. Um, and here we have a sort of semi-field set up where we have the colonies kept in the, in the laboratory. So we can monitor, we can actively uh, monitor the, the exposure that the bees are having to pesticides in the lab uh, with controlled feeding. Uh, but we can also allow the bees to forage outside on real flowers by going through tubes across a weighing bridge, as you can see here, and looking at how they go. They, these are radio frequency identification tagged bees. So they have a small passive radio transponder on the back of them which um, uh, is affected when they, they move across this bridge. So you can see it goes through the two readers and then out through these tubes, out through the window, and then the bees can go out and forage on real flowers and then come back. So the RFID system allows us to measure the time at which the bees pass out through these readers and come back in through the readers. So we have a real time timestamp of when bees are passing in and out of the colony. Um, and also we can observe and we can measure the weight change of the bees as they travel over this weighing bridge. So we can look at the amount of pollen and nectar that they're collecting. And that's exactly what we did. Um, when we look at the RFID data comparing colonies that were exposed to 2.4 parts per billion of thymothoxam compared to those that were not exposed to that, or at least experimentally exposed to pesticides, we can see that there's a significant difference in the duration of foraging bouts. Um, those that were exposed to thymothoxam conducted much longer foraging bouts, significantly longer foraging bouts, so each trip took longer for the bees, and that we see a, a lower proportion or a lower number of the bees came back carrying pollen. So there seem to be, this seems to be affecting uh, aspects about their foraging behavior, uh, including their ability or their desire to collect pollen. So they're bringing less pollen into the, into the colony and that's going to have a limiting impact on the amount of uh, brood that can be developing. Um, we're also thinking about how bees interact with, uh, with flowers. And we know that learning about flowers and learning which flowers are the most rewarding and when is obviously a very important thing. And I know Felicity Muth talked about that in her, in her presentation uh, a few weeks ago. Um, so I'm not going to talk extensively about that, but we have uh, we've done some work on on how pesticides might affect uh, learning different cues around flowers and why that might be important. So this is an odor learning experiment in which Dara Stanley and, and Karen Smith um, from my lab uh, worked on looking at how bees learn to, uh, to use uh, odors as predictors of reward. So this is a proboscis extension reflex conditioning paradigm which is very like Pavlov's dog. So we present the bees with an odor stimulus and then we give them a, a sugar water reward. And then after a while, they learn to pair that odor with reward and they stick out their proboscis, their reflex response in response only to the odor if they've learned that odor, odor reward association. So we can do that, we can do that with, with back with groups of bumblebees. And so we can compare the performance of bumblebees that were, have been fed uh, sugar water and those that have been fed sugar water that's been laced with different pesticides. And here again, we've looked at a neonicotinoid thymothoxam this, in this example, and we're looking at the mean number of bees that are responding in both their, their 15 uh, trial learning uh, process and also after a three hour memory test. So we found that both um, bees in the 2.4 and 10 parts per billion exposure groups learnt less quickly. Uh, they learnt to form this association with reward less quickly during the training trials. But in this experiment, what we can see is the, the, the three hour memory retention test. So we keep the bees harnessed for three hours and then we provide them with the odour and no reward after three hours and see how many of the bees have remembered that association they've learnt just the three hours before. And we can see if we compare the, the light gray bars 
those for 2.4 and 10 parts per billion treatment groups are substantially reduced, showing that the memories that they formed are substantially more friable for those bees. Um, so they're not learning or, or they're not re retaining that association uh, anywhere near as, as, as well as the control bees. And that may be problematic if you learn during a foraging bout that a particular odor of flower is rewarding or a particular color of flower is rewarding. It may be important for you to know that again later in the day or, or in subsequent days of your foraging career. And this kind of idea is borne out a little bit by some of Richard Gill's work, another former postdoc of mine, um, who did some work, uh, which we'll talk about on uh, combined exposure in a minute, but this is some data from, again, radio frequency identification tagged bees, looking at the foraging performance of those bees in a semi-field condition. So these are bees that are foraging outside the lab, but are being kept inside the lab. And if I draw your attention to the left hand panel here, um, initially, these are control bees with no exposure to pesticides that we've given them. And on the y axis, we can see the size of the pollen load that they're collecting. Um, and we can see that it starts out at about one and a half to two in this pollen load index. And over time, as bees get more experience of their environment, their ability to collect pollen, their efficiency of collecting pollen increases. So pollen load size increases, which is what we'd expect. And we've certainly seen this in some of our previous work um, uh, and, and many other studies have shown that this kind of, <clears throat> this is consistent with, with getting more familiar with the environment and, and processes of learning, although we're not measuring learning per se here. And if we compare this to the panel on the right hand side, where the bees were treated with a neonicotinoid imidacloprid, we can see that there's this, um, the same sort of deficit that we saw with Dara's work with thiamethoxam between, uh, between control and imidacloprid treated bees. So we can see that there's, a, that there's a discrepancy when bees are naive to their environment and that we don't see any evidence that the imidacloprid treated bees actually improve in their task performance. So they don't get better at collecting um, pollen. So it seems to be a twofold problem that there's an initial deficit and that deficit doesn't get corrected um, in the imidacloprid treated bees. So we see that that pollen foraging may be substantially affected for the lifetime of those, those bees as they're being exposed to this pesticide. <coughs> Excuse me. We also see evidence from Richard's work uh, that uh, the bees change the types of uh, pollen sources that they go to uh, when they're foraging. So uh, if we compare control on the left, those that were not exposed experimentally to pesticides with imidacloprid only uh, is I, Landesilothrin, which is a pyrethroid pesticide, um, is, is LC, and mixed is um, both types combined, so imidacloprid and Landesilothrin. And we chose these types of pesticides because imidacloprid was right, widely used at that point as a seed treatment for oilseed rape, and Landesilothrin was used as a spray to additionally control uh, pollen beetle on, these, uh, on this crop. So this is a, a common combination that would be, would have been used on uh, oilseed rape at the time when we did this work, um, although imidacloprid has now been withdrawn from use in the European community outside of uh, greenhouses, uh, so can't be used in this, in this situation anymore. So we can see when we look at the pie charts based on the color of the pollen loads that are being brought back, um, we can see that there are substantial differences in terms of which types of uh, uh, flower are being visited by the different groups. We can see that, uh, for example, the amount of dahlia pollen for those in imidacloprid and the mixed treatment also containing imidacloprid have gone up substantially uh, and other things have changed uh, accordingly. So we can see that, that, that there are different floral choices being made. So there is something about the insecticide uh, treatments that uh, is affecting the, the choices that the bees are making. Um, so that may be around their learning and memory, or it may be about their ability to find patches of flowers in the environment. We don't know that at this, at this point, uh, but it would be very interesting to, to track the bees and follow which, which types of patches they're visiting and follow those individuals. Some other work that Dara Stanley uh, performed looked at actually how um, these handling skills and floral preferences may be changing. So that's another thing that could be affecting the, the floral choices. If motor skills are affected by the bees, then their ability to actually handle the different types of flowers, to probe into them in different ways, to pack pollen onto their bodies might be changed. <clears throat> 
Um, so uh, Dara had a simplified uh, foraging array in which she faced bumblebees, Bombus terrestris, with uh, two different plants that we know bumblebees like, bird's foot trefoil, lotus caniculatus, and white clover, trifolium repens. And you can see a, a, a bumblebee visiting those in the, uh, visiting the, 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 the clover in the field. So in the experimental array, uh, Dara measured the number of uh, flower visits it took before the bees were very efficient at handling those flowers. And we can see here this here on the left, this is the number of flowers before they learned to handle effectively. Comparing bees that were exposed, bumblebees that were exposed to 10 parts per billion of thymothoxam or, or no exposure to pesticides. And you can see there's a substantial difference here. So it seems to, the pesticide exposure, the neonicotinoid exposure seems to um, affect the, the speed with which they learn or can retain or access um, the information about handling different types of flowers. So it's about two and a half times slower uh, at, learning the, at, at learning how to be effective at handling these flowers. And we can see as with Richard's work with imidacloprid that thymothoxam um, also has an impact on, on floral choices. So we can see the number of visits to Lotus caniculatus on the left here in the, mid, uh, in the middle left panel of this pair. Um, and we can see that more of the pesticide treated bees are visiting the Lotus, which actually seem to be the, the of the two flowers is the least rewarding, contains the, the lowest uh, sugar concentration of nectar between these two flowers. And we can see that the control bees are more likely to visit clover um, so that's really the, the opposite of the, of the other um, figure. So we can see that um, sort of floral choices and motor handling skills seem to be affected by exposure to, to uh, thymothoxam in this case. So these are all uh, data about individual behavioral changes um, that have been, uh, it, that have happened as a result of chronic exposure to low levels of pesticide, the sort of pesticide levels that might be, ex that they might encounter in nectar and pollen in the field if they're consuming that or if it's being fed to them uh, during their larval development. So when we're dealing with a colonial insect like a bumblebee, we were interested to see how this might affect colony growth and development. Um, so Richard set up some very small colonies of, of two to four uh, workers with a queen. Uh, he had 40 colonies, 10 in each treatment group, uh, 10 control, 10 that were exposed to the neonicotinoid imidacloprid um, in, uh, dissolved in sugar water uh, as a feeder that they could feed on, but they didn't have to feed on. Um, 10 that were exposed to Landis hyalothrin, which was sprayed onto um, uh, a filter paper and then allowed to dry and placed under the feeder so that the bees walked across it. So it was contact exposure before they reached the feeder. And then a mixture which had the Landis hyalothrin on the filter paper and then the feeder contained the uh, imidacloprid. So if, if the bees chose to use the feeder, they would walk across the Landis hyalothrin treated paper and then they would feed from the, the, the neonicotinoid treated feeder. So we have both combined and individual exposure to these things, and we can see the uh, the average number or the average number of uh, of live workers in each of these colonies on a day by day basis over a four week period of this of this experiment. And interestingly, you can see over the first sort of uh, first sort of two weeks of the experiments that we don't see any dramatic changes, but at about uh, 15 days we start to see significant differences, whereby all of the treatment groups. Um, so all of the single and combined pesticide exposure groups um, were substantially and significantly smaller than the control colonies that we can see in black here. So control colonies continue to grow uh, fairly healthily, and we see that those uh, pesticide treated colonies were substantially smaller, which is obviously a com combination of, uh, of eclosion rates, so new bees emerging and bees dying in the colony. So we were interested to see how those differences might arise. Because our bees were radio frequency identification tagged, we could obviously monitor who went out and how long they were out for and whether they came back. So we saw that with imidacloprid and thymothoxam from Richard and Dara's work, respectively, that, um, that pollen, foraging, uh, pollen foraging efficiency of individual bees and individual foraging bouts was compromised by exposure to these neonicotinoids. So we then uh, looked at how uh, the, the colonies might compensate. And it seems that if it, with exposure to imidacloprid, we can see in the inset here, uh, 
that the number of forages going out of imidacloprid treated or imidacloprid and lindocyloprid treated colonies um, uh, was substantially higher. And we could also see that the percentage of bees that were lost outside was related to the number of forages going outside. So more, more foraging is, is a higher risk of losing bees, bees going outside and either being lost, deciding to stay out of the colony for different reasons, or perhaps being lost to predation. We don't know which of those they, they were lost because of, but functionally they're still lost to the colony. And then we can add in those that we know the, uh, the fate of, the bees that we found dead in the colonies, and we can see that there's an additive effect of, uh, of, the, of the combined exposure. So we can see imidacloprid and landocyloprid comparing both the bees that are lost outside the colony and those that we found in the colony have similar but elevated rates of, uh, of bee loss compared to the control colonies. And we see that the, the mixture exposure to two of the pesticides had a substantially higher loss rate. And we know that the, the landocyloprid seem to have relatively quick uh, and acute mortality effects on bees. So shortly after application, we saw that there was a, a higher proportion of workers dying in those colonies and that many of those workers were not particularly old, so hadn't performed substantial uh, work for the colony. So there may be another impact that's happening there. So this is some of the first work to look at combined exposure and to show that those sublethal effects may be, uh, may, the com combined exposure may be uh, more important. And we also saw the highest level of colony failure for these, uh, for these mixed exposure colonies. So if we start to build kind of a, a model here of individual level exp exposure and how that affects colony development, we know that worker pollen foraging is critical for colony development because production of other bees, other workers in these bumblebee colonies depends on, uh, on the amount of pollen that's coming in to build those bees. So if we know that imidacloprid and also thymethoxam reduce the amount of pollen brought back to the colony, that's gonna have a negative effect on colony growth. So the colony is still responding to the amount of brood it has. So more foragers are, are, are going out to try and get pollen. And as we've seen, that increases the risk of worker loss outside. So there are fewer bees in the colony. And if you are in a situation where the colony is already quite small, has few workers, uh, that means there's fewer bees, therefore, inside the colony to look after the brood and do other important tasks inside the nest. And if we added the second pesticide, in this case, the, the, the pyrethroid landocyloprid, that we're also increasing adult worker mortality. So it's kind of a double whammy in this situation that we have the the, the two impacts on, on colony development. So these different impacts on individuals, both the sublethal impacts of the imidacloprid and the, the, the more acute lethal effects of the landocyloprid uh, are also having impacts on the, the colony demographics and, and likely also the reproductive uh, outputs of those colonies if we continued the experiments. So that's in line with, with a number of experiments that have started to show this uh, in the field. So this is some work that was done by my Rundloff and colleagues in Southern Sweden, where they compared the performance of different bee taxa um, to uh, eight fields that were treated, uh, were, were sown with oilseed rape, treated seeds with clothianidin, another one of the three main neonicotinoids that are used as seed treatments, compared to eight fields in which uh, the, 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 the seeds were treated only with fungicide and not with the neonicotinoid. And they compared the, uh, the diversity or the density of wild bees that they found around the margins of the field, and they found a significantly fewer uh, wild bees around the, the, the uh, fields that were treated with uh, clothianidin. Um, they also experimentally put uh, nests of cavity nesting bees, this, these uh, mason bees, Osmia bicornis, they put these tubes into the fields and they measured the activity of these bees and the likelihood uh, and the number of uh, cells that they provisioned in these, in these fields. And they found, they found measurable amounts of nesting in the control fields. So clearly the oilseed rape and surrounding environment was providing resources for those bees, but they found no nesting behavior or no completed nest cells in those treated fields. So there was a, a complete cessation of reproduction for their Osmia bicornis. And if we look at Bombus terrestris that we've talked about a lot already in this presentation, um, there was significant impacts on both male production when we compare the control to the treated fields. 
and also queen production. So there seem to be significant reproductive effects in the field. But then interestingly, if we look at the honeybee colonies that they placed that were balanced for colony strength and other measures, they looked at the, uh, the, the, the strength of those colonies in terms of the number of uh, frames that had uh, workers, workers on them. So the, the, the average number of workers in those colonies. And they were very, very similar when you compare the control and the treatment groups. So it seems that certainly in the field situation here that uh, Rundloff et al found in southern Sweden, that there's quite a distinct difference in terms of uh, the impact of these, depending on which of the bee taxa you look at. If you compared wild bees or solitary bees, you found very, sig you found very significant impacts, um, uh, including total cessation of reproduction for the, the solitary cavity nesting bees. S significant reproductive impacts or, uh, are on at the colony level for bumblebees, but no measurable impact for honeybees. And that's obviously quite important when we know that most of the regulatory work, most of the uh, decision making and environmental risk assessments that are done on pesticides are really focused on the honeybee. And they are for very good reasons because they're ubiquitous and they're easy to, to, to work on in all different regions of the world, well, bar Antarctica. Uh, and, and, and some other regions where they don't occur, um, but um, uh, uh, but they have some 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 issues. We know that they're quite unusual bees in terms of their ecology. We know that they do some very interesting things. Uh, both both Ellie Ledbetter and, and Margaret Cuvion in this series have talked about that extensively. So I don't propose to go into that, uh, but we can certainly see um, that they they are doing interesting things foraging in the environment. Uh, but we know that because they are um, in a, well, we, we suspect that because they're in these large perennial colonies of multiple thousands of individuals, that any individual level impacts on of pesticide exposure that may be affecting behavior at sublethal levels um, may be more buffered. So if you have multiple workers and you're able to just allocate more workers to a particular task, that will give you some environmental buffering from the effects of pesticide exposure to a certain point after which you might start to see impacts. So we wanted to, to look at this. Uh, 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 a former postdoc of mine, uh, Liz Franklin, decided to look at this with, it, with the published studies that have looked at uh, honeybee impacts, uh, the impacts of neonicotinoids on honeybees in, in semi-field or field studies. And really to look at sort of statistically at it and see which of these studies are actually going to tell us very much. So that was one of the things around the Rundloff study because you had eight fields and eight fields uh, and only a certain number of colonies, how much of a, an effect size could you actually potentially detect when you're looking at the, the number of individuals that are actually alive uh, in the colonies at the end of your experiments. And the different colors on this plot indicate the different types of neonicotinoids, clothianidin, imidacloprid, and thiamethoxam being the three main ones that have been used. And they're plotted uh, on this, uh, this diagram with those with studies that have the ability to detect the smallest effect sizes towards the center of the bullseye and those which will only detect large effect sizes towards the outside of them. And they're plotted uh, chronologically. So those that are further out uh, are typically those that were done earlier than those that are, are closer in. So we can see, for example, here with clothianidin that the studies initially were, were unable to detect anything but very, very large differences. And gradually they've become more sensitive as the, the size and scale of those experiments have increased. And obviously, uh, commensally, the cost of those experiments. So what we can critically see here on these are, are the, the European Food and Safety Author Agency's uh, regulations about what they think uh, detection should be uh, what the effect sizes that should be able to be detected. This is a 7% difference, this is a 15% difference, and this is a 35% difference. And you can see that most of the studies are actually well outside this 35% circle. So only about 27%, about a quarter of the studies that we found could detect even uh, a large impact, which is a 35% difference in worker numbers in those colonies. And you can see that a few of them, uh, none of them could detect a, a sample, uh, an effect size smaller than 15%. So this kind of suggests that although these, um, 
these are very attractive as an, as an idea to put out colonies uh, of, of honeybees in different situations where they've been exposed to pesticides or not, to look at their to look at their likelihood of survival in the field. It's actually very difficult to do this at the sort of scale that you need to do to actually measure any any differences that aren't really quite large in terms of the uh, effect size. So I also wanted to talk about differential toxicity. There's uh, quite a lot of different pesticide classes and different pesticide types. And here are four different insecticides that uh, uh, Kayla Monday Heights uh, in my lab, a PhD student has recently published um, looking at the, uh, the lethal levels of toxicity of these for the, bum the common Eastern bumblebee bombus in patients. And what we can see here is the uh, micrograms of active ingredient per bee necessary to kill 50% of the individuals within 48 hours of exposure. So this is a, an acute oral uh, exposure to these different pesticide groups. And you can see uh, very clearly that if we compare um, uh, cyanotronilaprol, which is a diamide, flupyridiferone, which is a butenolide, sulfoxifor with sulfoxamine, and thymothoxam, which is a neonicotinoid, Three of these have a very similar mode of action. They, they affect uh, nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the bees. So they affect the passage of information and through the nervous system and into the brain of the bee. So it's affecting sensory periphery and also potentially motor effects. Uh, and cyanotronilaprol uh, uh, um, is a diamide which is affecting the ryanodine receptors in the muscle. So effectively is paralyzing uh, the insect pests. So these pesticides, these insecticides are obviously designed to affect insects pests uh, and to, to combat them effectively where they are exposed in the field. But we're obviously looking at the potential unintended consequences of exposure to these pesticides on, on insects that, that have very similar uh, physiological and conserve physiological responses to some of these insect pests. And we can see if we compare flupyridiferone and thymothoxam that we actually have very, very substantially different levels of toxicity with much higher levels of the pesticide needed to kill 50% of the individuals in for the, for, uh, the butenolide flupyridiferone than thymothoxam, for example. And we're seeing more than a thousand fold difference in the toxicity of these pesticides. So if we were, if we were sort of a priori deciding which of these might be safer to use for bees, we might say that flupyridiferone, uh, things like Sivanto might be safer than thymothoxam, for example, or sulfoxifor might be slightly safer than thymothoxam because its toxicity to the bumblebees is a bit lower. But this is further complicated when we look at published data from, from honeybees we can see that the, uh, the patterns may be quite different depending on um, where we see uh, which taxa we look at and uh, which of the pesticides we look at. So we can see if we compare um, cyanotronilaprol, we can see that honeybees are substantially more sensitive and they're substantially more sensitive to flupyridiferone than the bumblebees. Uh, and if we compare uh, honeybees, uh, thymothoxam to flupyridiferone, the, the two uh, most extreme in this example, we see that again, there's a multiple hundreds of times uh, a difference in sensitivity across those two pesticide classes. But if we zoom in on sulfoxifor and thymothoxam, which are the most toxic to both of these taxa, we can see that the reverse is actually true, that bumblebees are more sensitive to both sulfoxifor and thymothoxam than they are, um, than, than, than honeybees are sensitive to these pesticides. And we can see that although these are, these are sort of eight times and three and a half times uh, more sensitive in, in these situations. So we can't, just, we can't just go to a honeybee, do the experiments on the lethal dose experiments on honeybees and then assume that the, the same levels of toxicity are going to be applicable to different wild bee taxa, so different non-apis taxa. And we, if we think about uh, sulfoxifor, which looks to be uh, a bit less toxic in some cases uh, and a bit more toxic in other cases. We're also seeing that uh, sulfoxifor has impacts uh, on bees in semi-field conditions. This is some work by Harry Civiter and colleagues at Royal Holloway, including Ellie Ledbeater and Mark Brown. Um, and this is a sort of semi-field exposure where bees were initially exposed to the sulfoxifor, the bumblebees were exposed to sulfoxifor in the lab to the left of this dotted line on the, on the figure. And they were then allowed to forage in the field. And you can see this is the number of workers produced. Uh, 
comparing sulfoxaphor, which is treatment, to control, which is uh, no exposure to the sulfoxaphor, uh, and the number of males produced, and the proportion of workers with pollen. And if we look at this, this figure, we can see, interestingly, in comparison to the impacts of uh, neonicotinoids, we see some similarities and some differences. We see similarities in terms of the number of workers uh, being produced seems to be affected, and also the number of males, and not reported here, the number of queens seem to differ between the control and treatment group with no queens produced by the, any of the treatment colonies and fewer males produced by the treatment colonies. But we don't see any predictable impact on, uh, on the pollen foraging behavior, which is quite different to the neonicotinoids. So the, the, the feedback and impacts on the colony level might be substantially different depending on the class of insecticide that you look at. So we started talking about uh, the pollination services, we started talking about the ecosystem services of bees um, and why they're important to us. We know they're important in terms of crop production uh, and food production for us. So obviously that's one reason why we should be concerned about bee declines. But do insecticides and do other pesticides potentially affect the pollination services that bees can provide to us? Well, Dara set out to ex ex explain ex explore this question with a bumblebee experiment looking at apple pollination and quite similarly to some of her other experiments particularly the um, the, the proboscis extension reflex experiment um, we use different levels of exposure to thymothoxam 2.4 and 10 parts per billion uh, in sugar water that the, the colonies were fed uh, in the lab then we took the the bees to um, to flight cages in which we'd placed different uh, apple uh, varieties. So we had a pollenizer, which was scrumptious, and we had a, a fruit stock, which was Everest, and we put those plants in. And clearly, we want to see movement between the pollenizer and the fruits, fruit trees. Uh, and we monitored the behavior of the bees, the, how likely they were to forage, how much pollen they collected, and critically, uh, what, this, what the results of that uh, pollination service might be. So on the left hand side, we can see uh, a graph showing the, the number of bees carrying pollen, uh, comparing control 2.4 and 10 parts per billion of thymothoxan. So we see the bumblebees have a gradated response uh, with bees as they are exposed to more pesticide, uh, uh, having fewer bees returning carrying pollen. So that uh, motivation or the ability to collect pollen has been affected, which is obviously in line with many of the other experiments that we uh, that I've presented here and that we've done uh, in, in, in addition to those. So we see reduced flow of visitation and pollen collection after chronic exposure to thymothoxam. And we also see when we look at the number of seeds produced per apple, so we marked uh, tagged up different flowers, that were exposed uh, to which were exposed to the, the the activity of the bees during our experiments, and then we followed those those apples. We measured lots of different aspects of them, and we found that the number of seeds produced per apple was significantly different when we compared those at the high and the low treatment level. So we don't see an impact at 2.4 parts per billion, but at 10 parts per billion, we do start to see a negative impact on uh, on the pollination service provided by them. So somewhere between those two levels, we we would expect to see a threshold at which that we start to see um, uh, pollination services being affected and obviously we could we'd like to see more data like this uh, for different cropping systems but it would be very interesting to uh, to understand what the impact on pollination services might be for exposure to pesticides So uh, I wanted then to move on to talk about some of the, the solitary ground nesting bee work that we've been doing. Uh, and a, a key difference here um, is, is going to be the, the routes of exposure. So most of the things that we've talked about up until this point have been about uh, contact or chronic or exposure to uh, consumption of uh, a contaminated nectar or pollen or contact with contaminated floral surfaces. So those have been the main routes of exposure and certainly they're the main routes of exposure that are important for honeybees. For, for bumblebees that nest underground, not all of the species, but many of them, and for, uh, most of the bumblebee species hibernate underground, 
uh, contact with soil may be very important. And we know that the majority of solitary bees are ground nesting. So they, they dig nests in the, in the ground, they develop underground. So they spend a good proportion of their life uh, digging, uh, contacting and being in contact with soil. So pesticide residues in soil may be very important and something that we haven't studied very much at all in general as a community. So uh, we've been working on the hoary squash bee or Eucera pruinosa. It used to be called Pepinapis pruinosa until, we, uh, until it was found that Pepinapis wasn't supported uh, and became part of Eucera. So that, that's just a nomenclatural change. But the hoary squash bee is still uh, very common in North America. It, it moved up uh, from Central America when uh, people moved crops, including cucurbit crops. Um, so it sort of followed those. So it is an introduced species into Canada, but it's been here a very long time. Um, and it's very closely associated with agriculture. It's a specialist, a pollen specialist on cucurbits. So it gets all of its pollen from uh, things like pumpkins and squash flowers. Uh, and because there aren't many of those wild in, uh, in Canada, then it, it's very, very associated with cucurbit production. Um, it nests in the ground in these fields around cucurbits. The, 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 the middle figure here shows uh, flags which mark the nest entrances to a whole bunch of different hoary squash bee nests in the ground. And the, the eagle eye of you will spot that that is not a cucurbit field, but that is a corn field, so a maize field. Um, and often cucurbits are in, uh, re, are in rotation with other crops like, like corn or maize uh, in this case. So applications that are happening in maize production may also be uh, important for, for exposure profiles for these bees. And, we can, and they're really nice that we can, we can go into the field and we can dig up uh, nests and we can uh, observe the, bee, the behavior of these bees as they're foraging in the field or we can experimentally manipulate the system to some extent. And we can find good numbers of these uh, bees uh, in relatively large nesting aggregations on some farms. So it allows us some experimental control of this system. So these are ground nesting bees. As I said, they're solitary bees. A female will dig chambers. This, is, this, is, this graphic is based on dimensions from Matthewson that dug up a lot of these uh, uh, nests in the 1960s and published the data. Um, so the bee, the female, will dig this, uh, this chimney and then we'll start to dig lateral tunnels and, and we'll, we'll move all of this material up to produce this, this mound above the ground. And then the first, uh, the first uh, lateral tunnel, she will go out, she'll collect nectar and pollen, she'll mix it into bee bread, and then she will lay her egg on top of it. Then she will seal that individual off. That will be the oldest of her larvae. And then she will backfill this tunnel as she, fill, as she excavates the next tunnel. So she will never see that offspring. Uh, she will never see it emerge and it will emerge next year and will never see its, its mother or father. And you will see that she continues to dig these and she digs five or six of these lateral tunnels in per nest. And she may produce multiple nests during the season if she has time and if she has the, the, the resources available. So we estimated looking at the bulk density of the type of soils that these bees um, uh, like to nest in and the amount of uh, time that they, uh, the amount of material that they have to move that these females are, are moving about 300 times their own mass, about 33 and a half grams of soil for each of these nests, which seems to be about par when we look at some other ground nesting females. The data is pretty sparse in, in the literature, but from what we can find, this seems to be quite uh, generally applicable for, for bees of a similar size, like some Andrina and Nomia species. So we were interested in um, what the the levels of exposure might be. So we, we gathered a lot of data that the Ontario government had, had measured a residue data for different pesticides in field soils. Uh, we did this specifically in cucurbit soils, but we also uh, did an estimate for general field soils because we know that rotation of crops, including corn and, corn, uh, and soy, uh, which can be, can be put into cucurbit productions in some years, may also have substantial carryover in terms of the persistence of these pesticides. Some of the residues will last more than a year. So uh, what, what was applied last year or even the year before may have an impact on what pesticide burden is found in the soil. 
And here we can see environmental exposure distribution. So this is the this is ranked uh, pesticide um, concentrations in soil from all of the samples that we found from this this publicly available database. And we compared that to the chronic exposure levels for, for bees based on um, based on moving 33 and a half grams of soil. Uh, so this is a female squash bee. And we didn't have specific um, LD50, so lethal dose 50 concentrations for squash bees because no one's actually calculated those yet. We're working on it, but we haven't yet got those. Um, uh, and so we used published data for honeybees, which is the, the red line, which is the, the mean of all the honeybee LD50 studies on those particular active ingredients the minimum honeybee level, which is the dotted line, and a solitary bee surrogate, which uh, based on uh, regulators like the European regulators use a tenfold safety factor. So we assume that solitary bees will be 10, ten times more sensitive than, than honeybees will be. So that might be a, a protective uh, assumption. So we can see that most of the curve, most of the real data, the residue data is actually at a higher concentration, at a higher residue level than these, these uh, lines. So even if we were to say these are as sensitive as honeybees, uh, we would see that about uh, nearly 90% of the clothianidin soil, soil residue levels and about 35% uh, 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 of the thymethoxam levels are to the right of uh, exceed those threshold levels. And if we look at the solitary bee levels, we can see that those ex exceedances are much greater. So we're making a number of assumptions here. We're assuming that um, the pesticide is all biologically available in the soil and that we're assuming that it, it will pass into the bees as they're working in the, in, the, in, the, in the soil. Clearly, we don't know what the level of permeability is to these, of these pesticides to the bees, and it may be substantially less than, than, than we've assumed in this model. But this certainly suggests that um, there is a, 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 a there is a potential risk of exposure to quite substantial residues of pesticides like neonicotinoids in this example um, in soil for these ground nesting bees, which we need to consider for uh, risk assessments. So that sets the potential for, for exposure, but what we wanted to actually do was actually look at whether there was an impact of um, whether there was a substantial impact of the actual modes of application that we used in cucurbits. So we set out to become uh, squash and pumpkin farmers for a few years, or rather Sue Chan did, one of my PhD students, and set up this rather splendid uh, field site with uh, 12 hoop houses in which she cultivated acorn squash and allocated different treatments to those. So she had control with no application of pesticide. She had uh, imidacloprid, which is a seed, uh, which was a soil drench applied at planting. Um, so that was done uh, as per uh, field, as per farmer's instructions. Uh, thymothoxam planted as a seed treatment using far more. So these two are both neonicotinoids. And um, uh, uh, an anthranonic diamide, chlorantrinolipol, which was applied as a foliar spray at the five leaf stage. So all of these applications, uh, uh, there, were, there were four different treatments. So the, the three individual pest insecticide treatments or, um, or, or, or the control with no treatment. So we were looking, all of these uh, applications were done substantially before the, the flowering period of the crop. So uh, the exposure could be through soil or it could be through uptake of these, these pesticides into the, the nectar and pollen of the, treated, uh, of the treated flowers. So once we'd grown these, these, pump, these uh, acorn squash in the hoop houses, we then proceeded to go to a different uh, farm uh, where, where we had a large aggregation of these nesting females and we collected uh, sufficient females to put uh, eight per hoop house in our, our field site. And we collected bees that we knew were mated because they were already collecting pollen and provisioning nests. So they had pollen on their back legs. We put them individually into Eppendorf tubes and we took them up to the field site overnight. We put them in the uh, refrigerator and then we released them the following day. And it worked ex spectacularly well. We had no mortality, so our bees were very, uh, I won't say happy, but they were, they were content to be traveling in this way and they uh, established very well in the, in the hoop houses. 
so inside the hoop houses, we had the, the plants growing down each side and uh, estimating the about the floral density that they would need to support eight females based on our, our field studies. Uh, we created a lovely nesting bed in the middle of the uh, uh, of the, the hoop house, which wasn't covered with mulch, which the bees roundly ignored. Um, so as they say, never work with children or animals. They do different things to what you expect. Um, and we measured or we followed individual nesting behavior of the bees. So we marked all the nests that we saw them uh, creating and start to dig. Each one marked with an individual, <coughs> excuse me, were marked with an individual nest marker and we followed uh, how long they were actively digging each of these nests. We followed a foraging activity, so how much pollen and nectar did they collect from the, the flowers in, in the hoop house, and how many bees were produced critically over a number of seasons. So what we can see here is the foraging data from Sue's experiments. Um, and we can see when we compare the four different treatment groups, there's a, a substantial outlier that, that the admire treated uh, hoop houses, those with uh, imidacloprid, collected substantially less pollen. So much more pollen was left on the anthers of the male flowers in these hoop houses. So either they are uh, not as motivated to collect pollen, they're not as able to collect pollen, um, or because they're not, or maybe if they're not. Um, nesting or is driven to nest, they're less driven to, uh, to collect as much pollen. We can see that the nesting activity also was significantly reduced and uh, in the admire treated hoop houses in both 2017 and 2018, compared to our control colonies, uh, sorry, control groups, uh, our corrigin treated groups with the, the cyanotronilprol or the farmor, which is the thiamethoxam. So this is the other neonicotinoid, which is applied as a seat treatment versus the soil, treat, uh, the soil drench uh, with the admire. So we can see substantial differences, no significant differences between these groups. So they were all nesting very effectively and they seem to be doing well in our hoop house experiment. Uh, whereas those in the admire treatment clearly were not collecting pollen and were not digging nests. So wh which is the chicken and which is the egg in that scenario? We can't untangle those at this point, but it would be very interesting to understand whether a lack of nesting, uh, it's likely that a lack of nesting will reduce your, the, the, the desire to collect pollen, but also the, the lack of pollen collection ability may reduce the ability or the desire to, uh, to, to, be, to be creating nests and, and trying to provision offspring. And critically, when we looked at the, uh, the population levels over the three years of our experiment, we saw substantially different results. So this is the number of offspring produced per year. The green, the green bars show the eight females that we put in initially, and the grey bars show the total number of offspring, both males and females, produced in each of these hoop houses. We didn't find a difference in the sex ratios, but we did find a substantial difference between treatments in terms of the number of the number of bees that emerged. So we saw substantially fewer bees emerging in the admire treatment. So uh, imidacloprid exposure is affecting both uh, is affecting the pollen foraging. It's affecting nesting behavior, and it's clearly having an impact on the population demographics in this sort of semi-field closed system that we've created. Interestingly, far more the thiamethoxam treatment also showed uh, uh, it showed initial growth, but that growth held steady, whereas control and corrigin both had increases year on year in terms of their population size. This was not statistically significant, but it's something we'd like to do some more experiments on with thiamethoxam. Uh, to see if that might be uh, something that is, is a kind of intermediate impact. But clearly, at this level, we have no evidence to support that. This is not uh, statistically significant when we do the analysis based on our sample sizes. So I think this is really interesting when we look at ground nesting bees. Um, very little work has been done on ground nesting bees, solitary ground nesting bees, and showing that this could be exposure that could be happening through the soil. Um, or it could be happening through consumption of nectar and, uh, 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 contaminated nectar and pollen. Clearly with the admire situation, they're not collecting that much pollen. So it would have to really be through the nectar. Um, we're in the process of trying to segregate those out in, in experiments where we will use uh, control uh, exposure of soil and control exposure of, of nectar and pollen and try and partition that out. But at this point, it could certainly be that exposure during in soil may be a significant uh, component of that uh, of that effect that we're seeing here, which has a substantial effect on population size or could do. Uh, 
Interestingly, when we looked at the uh, production of, of fruits, we were still seeing substantial fruit production uh, in all of our hoop houses. So that doesn't seem to be limiting with these population sizes. Um, but obviously, if you are seeing uh, uh, bees dying or bees not uh, re replacing themselves at the rates that we're seeing with our, our admire treatment, then um, farmers would be reliant on bees coming into their fields uh, from outside of those fields in each of those subsequent years. So unless you have an infinite supply of squash bees, which I assume we don't have, um, that's going to be that could start to become a problem if you continue to use uh, these kind of pesticides uh, in, in fields as a production system. Interestingly, and, and as a result of this work, we're, we're quite pleased that um, the pest, uh, PMRA, the Pest Management Regulatory Agency in Canada, has re removed the use of uh, neonicotinoid uh, soil drenches, including imidacloprid, from use uh, in cucurbit systems in Canada. So that, that was a, a really nice result, as, uh, uh, which was associated at least partially with the work that we did here on squash bees. We've talked a bit, a little bit about combined exposures, uh, and, and here's some very recent work that we're in the process of trying to write up. Sabrina Rondeau's uh, PhD work in my lab, um, thinking about some of these more uh, "quote unquote" be safe insecticides like Savanto, <coughs> which is a flu pyridiferone or a, a, a butanolide a pesticide uh, insecticide. Um, again, we, we we were using this in, in a squash bee situation, and we were using either Savanto prime, the insecticide, or quadristop fungicide, either individually or in combination. So we had our four treatment groups where we had control with no exposure, um, a group that was exposed to the insecticide only, a group that was exposed to quadristop, the fungicide, which is a mixture of azoxystrobin and diphenoconazole uh, as a product uh, singly, and a mixture of two, the insecticide as a drip irrigation, and the quadristop as a spray application uh, during vegetative growth, not during flowering. So we were interested to look at how squash bees might fare in our hoop houses in response to these different pesticides. Um, Flupyridiferin is not one that we'd included in Sue's work, but certainly was one we considered. So we were interested in understanding whether uh, things that have been touted as being more bee safe might actually be more uh, bee safe in terms of the impacts. In comparison to Sue's work, we didn't find any big impacts on, uh, on nesting behavior uh, when we looked at our comparisons, but we did find impacts on pollen collection. And interestingly, this was uh, in response to the fungicide application. So if we compare here the pair of bars on the left, which were control in terms of the fungicide and the pair of bars on the right, we see the impact of the quadris top, the, the mixture of fungicides is actually what is driving our impact on the number of unharvested pollen grains that are left on the male flowers. So we can see a significant impact, although not as, not as large as the impact we were seeing with imidacloprid, um, that the fungicide is having an effect on the behavior of the bees and that they're leaving uh, pollen in the flowers. Um, uh, for this part of the work, uh, Sabrina Rondo was also uh, assisted by Dr. Caroline Strang, uh, and this was looking at activity levels of the bees in in a, in a, in a uh, um, appar portable apparatus to look at the amount of line crossing that happened in these tubes for the squash bees. And here it's interesting that on the first day of ex the experiment, uh, or the first day after uh, of looking at the uh, activity of the bees, no differences were found in any of the treatments. But on the on day two, we see uh, an interactive effect between obviously time, because we see a time effect across the days, but also an effect of an interaction between quadris top, the, um, the fungicide, and savanto, the insecticide. So we see an increase in activity with the, the insecticide um, compared to the other groups when it's in combination with the fungicide. So that's very interesting and, and certainly is in line with some other I I I I experiments that have been done for bumblebees and honeybees on neonicotinoids, where uh, at low levels, some of those have increased activity in lab experiments. So this might be another similar kind of response because this is also modulated by nicotinic acetylcholine receptor um, effects. Uh, so this is an, an interesting result that we're we're currently working on. So uh, watch this space uh, for publications on that. 
The final thing I wanted to talk about is something that really is just hot off the press. Uh, Sabrina's work that we did in the, the fall last year, so we did this, uh, this was an autumn experiment to look at how uh, hibernating queens or queens going into hibernation might make decisions about uh, the soils which they choose. So Sabrina had been out looking for hibernacular, looking for overwintering sites for bumblebees uh, for a number of seasons and taking, uh, taking soil samples where she found uh, queens uh, looking for, for nesting sites. Uh, and we did some analysis uh, at Cornell University with the help of Dr. Scott McCart and uh, looked at the residues that we found in those different environments, both uh, for orchards and for more diversified farms. And as a result of that, we chose five of the most uh, popular, five of the most found uh, pesticides, and we mixed those into soil buckets and set up arrays in this sort of Latin square design uh, to give our, our queens a choice of which soils they might want to overwinter in. We set this up at the hoop house site, and this was quite a substantial undertaking with these 10, uh, we used 10 hoop houses. We mixed up uh, pesticides in low and high concentrations based on the residue data from the real sites. And we realized quickly that mixing that amount of soil was gonna be quite a substantial undertaking. So we needed five different, um, five different cement mixes to do that. We eventually moved eight tons of soil. So it was quite an undertaking uh, logistically and experimentally. Then uh, we put in uh, colonies of Bombus impatiens, the common eastern bumblebee, commercial ones into these hoop houses, allowed them uh, to, and allowed when they were producing queens and allowed those queens to, to mate in the, the hoop houses and then allowed the queens to uh, make choices about which of the uh, which of the soils they might want to choose as, as overwintering sites. So we did this, as I say, in the, in the autumn. Uh, a few weeks later, we went back to the site uh, and we excavated all of these, these boxes and we carefully went through like archaeologists trying to uncover uh, treasures and we found uh, different bees, uh, we found different queens hibernating in their hibernacula at different depths. Uh, in different boxes and then obviously related that back to the initial pesticides um, and this was all done uh, this was all done blind when we did the uh, experiment so we obviously have the results now and when we look this is what the, the when we when we excavate them this is what the the queens look like in their the hibernaculum it's a nice little image of them they have this little this little sort of uh, enclosure around them that they've dug down into Interestingly, we didn't find much difference in terms of the depth of which the, the queens dug down to. They dug down to about seven and a half centimeters in the soil, which was perhaps a, uh, which is in line with what people have found in the field uh, from some of the older literature. But when we look at the mean proportion of the queens found in each of these uh, nesting sites, we found uh, we had about 173 hibernating queens that we dug up. Uh, and interestingly, they did not. Uh, uh, show any avoidance response to any of the pesticides. In fact, they were much less likely to nest in the control soils, which is here, our CTL, which is untreated soil or, or it's uh, solvent control soil, compared to boscolid, uh, uh, chlorantrinilopril, which is a diamide insecticide, boscolid is a fungicide, clothianidin and uh, a neonicotinoid insecticide, cyantrinilopril, which is another diamide, and diphenoconazole, which is another uh, fungicide. So we can see substantial evidence that here, well, we can see evidence that these bees are actually choosing or, or not avoiding uh, contaminated soils and may actually be ch preferentially choosing those contaminated soils, which is obviously interesting. There's certainly been some evidence, although not uh, uniformly supported, that neonicotinoides may be uh, at least partially attractive to some bumblebees like Bombus terrestris when, uh, and honeybees when fed in sugar water uh, at certain concentrations. But I know uh, some, some more recent data from Felicity Muth and others have suggested that that's not always the case for Bombus impatiens. So it may be quite species specific. So for, for uh, neonicotinoids, we may be finding differences in the attractive level, uh, the attractant levels of these pesticides, although how they're detecting these pesticides is perhaps unclear because it doesn't seem that in their sensory periphery that they, they, they can detect them uh, chem chemo, uh, with their chemosensory uh, equipment, perhaps post-ingestive feedback loops may be important for detecting 
uh, neonicotinoids. But clearly here with soil, we don't know that the, how they're detecting the differences, but it seems that they are avoiding the control of the untreated soil. So that's obviously a very interesting result and something we want to explore more thoroughly. And, and, and Sabrina has ongoing experiments looking into this more. So again, watch this space. So some conclusions and implications, I guess. Um, lots, of, lots of information, lots of evidence, um, uh, particularly uh, looking at neonicotinoids. They've had uh, uh, a very substantial amount of work done them on in, in my lab and many other labs around the world, um, suggesting now that chronic field level insecticide exposure can affect a whole range of different behavioral uh, and physiological functions. We can see that for, for non-apis bees, this can affect nest and colony foundation by bumblebees uh, and also nest foundation by these ground nesting solitary bees. We see learning and memory impacts. We see certainly impacts on pollen foraging in both of these groups and impacts on flower choice. Less, less clear for things like squash bee because we know that they're pollen specialists. Uh, whether it affects nectar, flowering, uh, nectar choices in the field is unknown at this point. We see impacts on colony growth and development and certainly impacts on reproduction from a whole bunch of different studies that have been done uh, with semi-field or field experiments uh, and including our work on squash bees in, in the field or Sue's work. Um, and, and these sort of lead us to, to have concerns about the potential impacts on population stability and persistence. Uh, we've been working on uh, common and, and pretty ubiquitous species. Uh, clearly, we don't know what the impacts on rarer species are and species at risk. Uh, and it would be concerning if we were if we could extrapolate and find those those impacts on those species at risk. We're starting to see more and more evidence that effects can be exacerbated by combined pesticide exposure. And when we start to think about the exposure profiles, we know that uh, a combined exposure is probably pretty likely uh, in agricultural settings where multiple pesticides are being applied in the same field setting and multiple crops may be, uh, may be uh, visited by the same bees. We see differential sensitivity to impacts depending on the life history and ecology of the bees. So we can see very big differences when we're looking at solitary bees versus bumblebees and, and, and comparing that to honeybees. So that's obviously a concern and that's something we need to think about when, when making risk assessments. If we choose to do all of those risk assessments on one group, how much we can extrapolate that to the other groups, particularly when we're doing that on uh, social bees like honeybees and most of the bee species that we know about are actually solitary and many of those are ground nested and these different associated routes of exposure that may not be relevant for some of the test organisms like honeybees who don't come into contact with soil very much at all. We see some evidence of impacts on crop seed sets. Uh, how much that might be important for wild plants is going to be, in, is going to be something that we need to know more about. Uh, clearly, if we're concerned about pollination services for crops, as we should be, uh, this is an, another factor that we need to think about uh, that the sublethal impacts of pesticides may be important. And I mean, we've already touched on this revising risk assessments to include these additional um, exposure routes like soil exposure and making sure that we're capturing the sort of levels of exposure and the risks of exposure for appropriate taxa um, that, that, are, that are covering all of the different types of exposure that we might see. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the great people who I work with and are lucky to collaborate with. Um, many of my lab members have been represented in this presentation and I couldn't do the work without them. And obviously thank you to all the funders who graciously fund our work in different, at different times and different projects. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry that was a bit longer than, uh, than I expected. Uh, uh, I'm happy to take questions if that's, if that's still something we have time for. Thank you, Nigel, for this very interesting talk. Um, yeah, are there any questions? So if you have Oops, a question, so. uh, raise your hand um, or pop it in the chat. So there is a question by Lara Cross. Um, she says, thank you for the great talk. Have you also done, or do you know of choice experiments where bumblebees or bees 
can choose between pesticide treated flowers and untreated flowers? We haven't done any experiments like that, but I think it would be a great thing to do. Um, certainly, uh, let me think. I'm trying to remember. This has been um, not, not flowers themselves, uh, but I think this has been done with, this has certainly been done with feeders in, in controlled in conditions in the lab. Uh, the, um, Jane Stout's group and, and um, Geraldine Wright's work uh, suggested that, that that's what I was kind of alluding to with the neonicotinoids being uh, preferred over non over control syrup uh, when when looked at with uh, but they were in small choice chambers. Uh, I think more recently Andres RK and Richard Gill uh, have done some work looking at that in with arrays of feeders, and they found some evidence of of attraction to feeders that were treated with uh, compared to, so that's more of a free flights choice experiment, although that wasn't done with free flowers. So I think, uh, with real flowers, sorry. So I think that's something that would be would be a, a, a logical next step for that work, sure. Thank you. Do you have any other questions? Well, maybe in the meantime, I can ask a question. So one of the things that I guess is very important is our species specific effects or differences between species with the same um, pesticide. And I was just wondering how much we know about the factors that explain this. So lifestyle will be a very important one, but I was also thinking about things like um, body size or flight range. Um, how much do we know about the role that these play for explaining these differences? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Um, in terms of body size, you, 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 might make, you might make hypotheses that larger body size might, might be able to, to deal with pesticides a little bit better. It seems to be unclear that that's necessarily true. I mean, certainly when we, look, when we compared honeybees and one species of bumblebee, we see sometimes pesticides are uh, one sort one active ingredient is that there's one group is more sensitive than the other and other times the other is true so you can't make a mm -hmm. an obvious con conclusion about just body size make um, bees more resilient to pesticide exposure sadly uh, I don't think we understand it as fully as we should again flight range absolutely that's going to be related to to lifestyle we know that there's a big difference between we know that there's a body size effect for for flight range broadly um certainly among solitary bees uh but some of those are obviously going to be flying over very very short distances maybe tens or hundreds of meters so that might affect their their exposure how it affects their sensitivity i don't think we have a really good handle on um i mean there is there are certainly some meta-analyses where they've looked at um, all the data we have across different species and, and we see variability, but it's not, I don't think it's fine-grained enough for us to know what, whether it's body size or flight range yet, but I think that's a really interesting question to ask for sure. We've got a question from Tegan. For the choice experiments, were you able to account for effects that queen hibernation proximity may have had do queens prefer to hibernate within proximity of each other? Uh, great question. And we're talking about the last experiment, I think. Um, we didn't find particular evidence to suggest that they were choosing to hibernate sort of in groups. Um, I know there is sort of anecdotal evidence from the field that sometimes you find multiple, uh, uh, you find multiple queens hibernating near to each other. And certainly we found that there are areas where they're obviously, uh, they're obviously good for hibernation, good hibernation sites. So whether that reflects the fact that they're choosing to be there or whether that's just a limited number of, uh, of uh, hibernation sites that are good, uh, I, I'm not sure where we could uh, discriminate between those. But certainly in our experiment, we didn't find evidence to suggest they were aggregating in certain boxes. And that was one of the reasons why we did the Latin square to try and uh, look at spatial distributions of the, the queens to make sure it wasn't just 
is this the closest box to the nest to the nest box or is this the furthest away or, or those kind of effects so we've tried to control for that although obviously it's not a, a field experiment in that sense there were limitations to how far the bees can go etc so they they had uh, they had only limited choices. Should I go for Fiona's question? Yeah. yeah, please go. Have you considered whether solitary bees are affected by being provided sugar solutions versus pollen? And when looking at pesticide tests, if just sugar solution or having them choose between pollen and sugar solution affects the results? Uh, with our solitary bee work, we haven't done any work with, with squash bees in the lab, that being one of the reasons it's kind of harder to work with them uh, compared to honeybees and, and bumblebees in the lab will we'll consume sugar water and, and, and honeybee collected pollen fairly readily. Uh, solitary bees seem to be quite uh, finicky sometimes. Um, so all of the work that we've done with the squash bees has been done in in enclosures so they've been feeding on real flowers so the nectar and pollen is coming from their choice um uh, well, their, their own choices so uh, i mean they have limited choices in the <clears throat> in the in the experimental arena but we know they're specialists on those pollens so that's the type of pollen and nectar that they would feed on in the field um we have one uh other question by an anonymous person. So now that the neonicotinoids have been banned, are we seeing an increase in bee populations in Canada or other places uh, that have banned them? Great question as well. Um, I think um, they, they haven't been banned in Canada. Uh, they have been restricted for use in European Union and that's now quite a substantial restriction on three of the main neonicotinoids. Um, uh, if, is there any evidence that that has really affected bee populations? I, I don't think there is, a, there is strong evidence on that. Uh, and I think that's partially because we didn't have a really good pre-moratorium baseline on that for many species. Um, so I think really the evidence is, is lacking that that has shown a strong impact uh, anecdotally, I think there are there are some suggestions that there have been uh, improvements in some areas, but uh, I, I don't think there there are robust quantitative data that show that. And in Canada, uh, we're still in the process of uh, uh, there have been some restrictions to regulation in uh, for certain crops in Ontario and to some extent in Quebec, but uh, in terms of federal regulation, there hasn't been much. And, and I think in, in many parts of the world, neonicotinoids are still very widely used. So uh, we have a lot of evidence that neonicotinoids um, may be problematic for bees. Um, oh, sorry about that. Um, so that, that could be, um, yeah, I think that's, we, we, don't, we don't have quantitative data to show that it necessarily, that specifically has, has had the impact that, uh, that we'd like to see. Um, there was a, another question that's kind of related to that, because I was also wondering up, about potential long-term effects of, yeah. of pesticide use. So Lara Gross asked, are there ways to reduce pesticide residues in the soil or water, since you said that 80 to 95% of pesticides don't even end up in the flower? Um, yeah, I think, I think there are. Uh, I think... Um, uh, more judicious use of pesticides and deciding what we're using and when uh, trying to match the used patterns with pest of pesticides to the need. I think that's been one of the things that we've really learnt or has really come out of all of the study of neonicotinoids. Um, because most neonicotinoids are applied as seed treatments, we're making decisions about when to apply those pesticides before the growing season in which they're going, because you have to order the seed in advance. So um, one, of the, one of the advantages, I think, of the regulations in seed, um, seed coatings has been increasing farmer choice. Certainly that seems to be the case in, in Canada, that where there's been a regulation restriction, um, seed producers are having to produce treated and untreated seed so that the, the farmers can make more choice. 
Um, uh, and I think in terms of the residue levels, that is starting to, to have an impact um, in terms of the, the neonicotinoids. Whether that is just being replaced by other chemicals instead is not, is not currently super clear. Um, but it, it, I, I don't think we're seeing as a re re removal of one set of pesticides, we're not going to suddenly see that no pesticides are applied. So there's going to be some turnover of the active ingredients that are used. I think generally we're going to have to think more carefully about that in terms of sustainable agriculture, um, what pesticides we're using and how much we're using of those. Um, but that's part of a really much bigger conversation around monoculture cropping and how we how we manage pests in general. Um, so that from a from a from a bee perspective, from a um, a non-target arthropod perspective we can obviously say that or not obviously we can say this pesticide or that pesticide is particularly injurious and this one might be safer but um, we know that there are certainly impacts on lots of these different uh, of lots of these different active ingredients sorry my computer is doing something weird okay have you have you, have you got me have, have you lost yeah. me we, we can see and hear you, yeah. Okay, good, good. Um, so yeah, I think I, I, I think working towards reducing our pesticide burden is certainly a good thing to do where we can. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, certainly. So to so try and match the pesticide res, the pesticide applications that we're using to the the types uh, to to the pest pressures, and then I think. You know, with the change to more prophylactic use of pesticides in some situations, that that kind of link has been partially lost. Can I uh, can I ask a question just in between? So, um, Nigel, do you have any kind of because you are kind of like uh, an expert in um, the effect of pesticides? So, are you in contact or kind of like with policymakers? Are you kind of like are they kind of like asking you or is an interaction? I mean, do you think that there's a direct influence from you or how does it work? I mean. Uh, that's uh, another great question. I mean, we, we have, uh, I have had interactions with, with um, pesticide regulators uh, in, uh, in the US EPA, uh, PMRA in Canada and EFSA in, the, in Europe. Uh, and British regulators as well. Do they come to us sort of proactively? Rarely. I think we have to reach out to them and say, look, we've done this work. We think it's important. We'd like you to consider it. I think they read the work because um, they usually know about it when we when we speak to them about it. Um, so I think the work is it, it, it sort of goes through the process. Uh, sometimes that can feel a little... Um, how quickly they respond to those kind of those kind of studies is 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 less clear. So it, it's not necessarily. Um, it, it, I think it would be nice to have more dialogue between researchers and uh, and regulators. I think that would certainly help. Uh, and I don't think we have as much dialogue as 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 would be helpful. Okay. So there are, there are additional questions in the chat. So one is uh, by top of one farms. Does lacing pesticides with a smell ingredient repel foraging pollinators to the lethal time duration lapses? This is as a compromise to save them. Um, it's an interesting idea. I mean, if we could find things that that necessarily repelled pollinators uh, when and that was associated with the concentration of the, the pesticide that's been applied, that would be a, that, that is one potential solution or one potential mitigating factor. I think most of the time we are, um, we are m making restrictions about when we apply pesticides to try and minimize the likelihood that bees come into contact with those pesticides. But obviously that requires people to follow those instructions um, and that's not always possible. Uh, or, or desirable. So uh, that's an interesting idea for sure. I don't know of any evidence to suggest that that's, uh, um, you'd have to find chemicals that, that would reliably uh, 
repel those those pesticides or would reliably repel the bees or other pollinators during that so that was it's an interesting idea okay so there's another one by singh has there been any experimental work done to quantify exposure via soil especially accounting for the transfer rate from the soil to the bees uh not that I know of, and I think that would be a really cool experiment to do, and clearly that's very important. Um, we know that certain solitary bees uh, are line their nests with different substances, and, and clearly uh, that may have a mitigating effect, um, or it may, uh, that's usually, uh, we believe, around water management in the soil, but it may also affect other um, other chemicals moving into the bees. So that would be an interesting thing to look at and certainly something that we need to have a better answer to. I, I totally agree. Let's hear. Christoph, do you have? Um, any questions left? Then, okay, then, then I'm asking a question. <laughs> so uh, Nigel, so you know, I, I'm not in the pesticide research. And, um, and uh, so being in India, right? I mean, so we expect that there's a, it's a huge amount of pesticides. And, but there are kind of like really only a few research groups working on it. And mostly they kind of start repeating some experiments with kind of, I mean, the worst case was Apis mellifera, which is not native pollinator yet. So is there any advice for kind of Asian countries? I mean, where they should go, where they should start? I mean, okay, that's a broad question, but um, mm. so, so, but you know, I, I was really, really positively impressed by the different question that you ask and kind of like, so I've never kind of like really read kind of, I mean, I'm not uh, on top of the game, but, so um, the question of the soil that you kind of worked on, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it, it kind of really kind of showed me a broader perspective on it. Most of the time, it's kind of like pesticides on learning and memory and then Apis mellifera. This, th that appears to me, right? And, and, and um, yeah, so, in, 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 in your suggestion also particularly, like, so showing that it's probably better to go to the solitary species right because they are way more sensitive and, and of course then it's kind of more difficult to do experiments with them right yeah so i think that's 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 your trade-off isn't it that you're um I, I can see why people are uh, are working on honeybees because it's it's easy to do and you can get experimental replication fairly easily and you can do all of these things I think it would be really nice to to have more people working on solitary bees and how um, how how they are being affected. I mean, there's there's more work on cavity nesting bees, which I haven't uh, represented here at all. So, I mean, there's certainly work going on on cavity nesting solitary bees uh, like Osmia and, and Megachile and those kind of things. Uh, but we don't have we we have very little on on solitary ground nesting bees. I think trying to trying to ex to look at links between sublethal effects on on different taxa and how that's affecting population persistence and stability i think is very important and i think trying to nibble away at the the questions around uh how it's affecting pollination service provision as well because i mean i think if you start to link it to financial implications like well, these are these are key these are key pollinators for crop X, crop Y, and actually by using these pesticides on those crops, you're, you or, or crops that are grown in the same region that the bees are foraging on, you may be affecting the pollination service. Then I think that's a that's a big one. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm not as familiar with the the extent to which managed poll managed pollinators are used in India as as perhaps I might I should be. Um, but I mean, certainly, uh, we are relying increasingly on honeybees to do a lot of pollination. So that's uh, uh, something we need to be moving more about, more back to 
to su supporting and sustaining wild pollinators to do their jobs that they that they've always done for us. And that's going to be increasingly problematic as the as as there are more and more of us and we have placed greater demands on our environment for food production. Thank so you. I think they, they would they would be my yeah I think more people working on solitary bees and, and, and working out the problems of working with them would be really cool. Uh, it isn't easy, that's the difficulty. So, but I'm sure there are there are taxa that could be used. So that would be really interesting. Actually, just for your information, pollination is not really a public topic in India. Right. Yeah? So, so it's, it's really kind of like it, abysmal, the differences, right? There's no discussion about that. Right. At all. Well, that would seem like something that, that uh, I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure many people are trying to work on, and that would be a, a good thing to, to, yeah. to increase that public understanding because it's, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, it must be very, very important. Yeah. I mean, certainly when you look at maps, India is kind of a hotspot of pollinator dependent cropping, isn't it? So, yeah. Okay, I don't want to talk in detail about it. We can kind of have That's a little bit. So we have a question from Daniel. Uh, uh, just wanted to say that we were also wondering whether bumblebees or others can directly detect the presence of neonicotinoids. Uh, there, there again, as you mentioned, different species may be differently equipped. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, I, I think I mentioned the, the Kessler work from uh, Jane Stout and, and Jerry Wright's labs combined. They did some uh, electrophysiology work to look at whether they could detect neonicotinoids, but this is honeybees and bumblebees, and they were not responding to the active ingredients uh, in the sensory periphery. So that, that was a bit of a puzzlement because if they're, if they're actively choosing them or preferring them, how are they doing that? Mm. So uh, there was sort of also, it was complicated by an antifeedant effect of some of the neonicotinoids at higher concentrations. So they, they hypothesized that that might be due to uh, post-ingestive feedback mechanisms that were causing, that were being detected by the gut somehow. Um, I forget the details. It's been a while since I've read the paper, but I think that's, that's the, that was the, the basis of that. But then there's been a few more papers that have come out since they're looking at whether they're, how they're detecting them and, uh, well, not how they're detecting them, whether they are preferring them or not preferring them, as I said, uh, some work by Felicity Muth and, and uh, Andres Arke uh, working with Richard Gill. Um, yeah, so I think that that's still a bit of an open question. And as for other pesticides that we know so much less about, that's really difficult. Uh, I think that's one of the thing, the other things that we that, that sort of comes out of this literature. We've we've invested a huge amount of of research effort globally into neonicotinoids, and you know uh, there are other there are many other active ingredients that are being used in different ways, and so understanding more broadly what the the risks and, and, and impacts are is definitely an important thing that we need to get a handle on. Let me add something to it because, uh, so uh, Andres Aneas, I mean, in a, a previous session, he kind of hypothesized for honeybees that the foragers do not respond uh, to the pesticide, but nurse bees in the hive. He, uh -huh. he does not know, he does not know how or something like that, but, and, and, and it's surprising, right? It's some, mm -hmm. somehow surprising. But he said that he had some supporting uh, evidence for that and, okay. and wanted to re, uh, uh, research on that. Sounds right? good. Didn't kind of, it, there were first data about yeah. that, something like that. I'll have to go back to his talk again. I must, must have missed that one. Uh, yeah. Cool. OK, um, any last question left? Last opportunity to ask Nigel. I mean, not here. the last opportunity. You can always <laughs> send me an email. Yes. Or DM me on. Have we compared the susceptibility of solitary bees to pesticides in different seasons? Because seasons could affect the sensitivity of pesticides in Apis mellifera. Uh, no, we haven't yet. Um, uh, I think it would be. 
uh, I, I guess the closest we've come is probably the environmental uh, uh, if, uh, environmental concentrations that we found in soil because those soil uh, residue levels were taken prior to application in the spring. So they were effectively actually the residues from the previous year. So obviously the dynamics, the year to year and seasonal dynamics are gonna be important in terms of what the exposure profile looks like. Um, but no, we haven't done that yet. Again, it would be something that would be obviously very interesting to look into. Because we know that that's, that's true, as you say, for honeybees and the extent to which they are exposed varies across the season. There've been a number of studies that have started to look at um, at least the residues that are coming into honeybee colonies. And, and obviously other things like the, uh, the, the extent to when mitocides are put into the colony is gonna affect the pesticide burden as well for honeybees. No problem. Okay. Super. Um, if there's no other question, then I would like to thank Nigel again. That was really a very interesting talk. And thanks everyone for the interesting discussion. And um, I hope to see many of you again next week. Um, and uh, yeah, have, have a nice day. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for everyone for a nice discussion. It's been fun. And thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.